Someone has said, 5% of the people think. 35% of the people think they think. And 65% of the people look for a slogan. Now, that I don't know about those numbers. I don't know how they came up with them. But I think there's some truth to that. In my experience, most people don't think. What they do is they practice group think. That what they think is what is going to conform them to the group they're a member of. But there are people who do think. And when they come in contact with Christianity, they often start asking questions about Christianity. Matter of fact, um, they can ask some tough questions. For example, uh, how do you know there's a God? How can you be sure there's a God? Is the Bible reliable? Are miracles possible? How can a just God condemn people who never heard of Jesus Christ? How can God be loving and allow suffering? How can you say that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven? Now that's just a sample. There are others. Those are the tough questions that Christians often get. Now, what do we do? Uh, how do you answer those kinds of probing and penetrating questions concerning Christianity? Well, some people just ignore those questions. They don't bother to think about them or figure out how to answer them. On the other hand, there are those who think, oh, yes, we have answers and they think those answers will convert people to Christianity. Well, I have a position that's somewhere between those two extremes. In the words of John R. Stott, who struck a balance, he said, quote, We cannot pamper to man's intellectual arrogance, but we must cater to his intellectual integrity. And that, I think, is the balance between the two. We must attempt, in my opinion, to at least show the reasonableness of Christianity by giving reasonable answers to those who have honest questions about it. At the same time, we must recognize that answers alone do not win people to Jesus Christ. It is the gospel that is the power of God to salvation. However, those answers, reasonable answers, can eliminate some of the barriers and make people more willing to listen to the claims of Christianity. But it's not just unbelievers who ask intellectual questions about Christianity. Doubts crowd into the minds of believers as well. They, too, need reasonable biblical answers to the questions. So, what I propose to do is present a series of messages on each of these and other questions that I just mentioned. What I would like to do is um, give you answers when you face people who are asking these questions and maybe Answer some of the questions you've had yourself. So today, for starters, I'd like to address the question, can you prove there is a God? Have anybody asked you that? You know? Well, there are different motives for why people answer it. Some ask the question because they want the answer to be yes, and they just need ammunition. Others ask the question because they don't care whether there is or there isn't. They just want to know the truth. And some ask that question because they are antagonistic toward Christianity and really want to challenge Christianity and even argue the answer that you give them. Well, regardless of what the motive is, we need to honestly address the question how can we prove there is a God? So let me start by saying the Bible 
doesn't even try. The Bible is not the least bit interested in trying to prove to you that there's a God. As a matter of fact, the whole Bible, from the first verse to the last, assumes there is a God. Did you ever read the first verse? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's all it has to say on the subject. It does not attempt to prove the existence of God. It assumes it. Uh, however, it does tell us in the New Testament that we should be able to give a reason to those that question. So while it does not try to prove the existence of God, it does teach us to be able to give reasonable answers to those who ask. So, let me begin on this particular question by saying this. We cannot prove the existence of God scientifically. If you think about it, in order for something to be proved scientifically in the strict sense of the term, whatever you're examining must be repeatable. For example, if I held two containers in my hand and I said, if you mix these two together, there will be an explosion, and you say, I don't believe it, I'll prove it to you. I pour them together and boom, there is an explosion. Somebody else comes along and says, well, I don't care what you did in the past, I don't believe it. Well, let me show you. And I take the two liquids, pour them together, boom, there is another explosion. That, in the strictest sense of the term, is scientific proof. Something must be repeatable. Now, there's another kind of proof that isn't the only kind of proof. Maybe we could call it legal proof, in which there isn't something, isn't repeatable, but there is evidence for it. And then we get into, is there a preponderance of the evidence? Is it beyond the shadow of a doubt? And you can measure the evidence, but the idea is, here is the evidence, you decide. Or to say that same thing another way, what we say is that here is a proposal. Here is the evidence, now you draw a conclusion. That, it seems to me, is a logical, reasonable, sensible way to come at this. So I would like to simply say, I think there is a God. That's our proposition. So the question then is, what is the evidence for the existence of God? Well, that's what I want to address today. You ready? I'm going to give you three areas of evidence for the existence of God. Turn to Romans chapter 1. And while you're turning, let me explain that uh, I'm going to say the first evidence for the existence of God is called reason. Now, the essence of reason is that things do not just happen. There is a cause. The essence of reason is there is a cause. So cause and effect. Now, there are all kinds of philosophical arguments for the existence of God. I'm going to lump them together under reason. Those are... All those arguments come down to cause and effect, every one of them. You can get as philosophical as you want, go all the way back to Aristotle, but it comes down to cause and effect. Now, let me explain what I mean. I'm arguing that reason, uh, just logic, cause and effect, is evidence that there's a God. And so does Paul. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. This has always fascinated me. Would you look at this verse? His invisible 
attributes, invisible attributes, are clearly seen. (laughs) All right, uh, what do you have in mind, Paul? Well, he has in mind his power and his Godhead. Now, here is cause and effect, if I can put it that way. What he's saying is, you look at the the universe, the natural universe, and you say, wow, that's the effect. What's the cause? And the conclusion is, there's a God. And if you just look at the natural universe, you would have to conclude that, well, we know something about that. God. He has power, and he says in here he has Godhead. Now, let me explain that. Aristotle actually used this kind of argument. He said that there is motion, but that must have a cause, and you can trace the cause back only so far at infinitum, but at some place you must stop, and that's the first cause. And he called that God. Now, Paul does the same thing. And he says you can look at the universe and conclude there's a cause, God, and you can figure out he must be powerful to put this here. Let me give you just one small sample. We are told that there's a sun. If you put a hole in it, a cavity of some kind, I am told it would take 1,200,000 Earths and 4,300,000 moons to fill that little hole. And our sun is small as compared to other suns in the universe. As a matter of fact, our closest neighbor is so far away from us that one estimate is that it would take 30,000 years for us to get there with the, the kinds of speed we have now times four. That's enormous. I mean, think about that. There is an enormous universe. Well, in the way I'm talking today, That's a big effect, and that demands a big cause. So what do we know? There's a cause. The cause is God, and we know he's powerful enough to put this universe there. Now, can I I give you the technical word for that? I mean, if you you study philosophy, they're going to give you the technical. Can I give you the technical word? You know what the technical word for that argument is? It's called cosmological. Cosmos means the world. It's the Greek word for world. And logical means knowledge. So the cosmological argument for the existence of God, which is all based on cause and effect, is there is this universe out there that has to have a cause. Now, still within the area of reason, there's a second little argument that has to do with cause and effect. And it's called the teleological argument for the existence of God. This is really technical stuff, isn't it? I told you at the beginning, some people don't think, and some people don't think, don't think they think, and others look for a slogan. This is not slogan day. You're going to have to think for a little bit. What's the teleological argument for the existence of God? It's real simple. It's that if you look at this creation, this universe, There's design in it. So, the design argues for a designer. It's as simple as that. Scientists have estimated that were the diameter of the earth any smaller, the density of the atmospheric blanket that make up the air would be so thin that in the absence of direct sunlight, sufficient heat would not retain the intense cold, and intense cold would result. Under such conditions, all forms of animal as well as human life would perish. The water of the earth would freeze to such depths that even the lowest forms of life would be extinguished. 
On the other hand, if the diameter of the earth were <clears throat> the smallest bit greater, a matter of inches, the air would become correspondingly dense. Under these conditions, more solar heat would be abandoned and retained, which would be insufficiable, insuffi insufferable. Excuse me. The atmosphere would con uh, contain enough oxygen to support life, not even enough to permit uh, excessive oxidation. The distance from the sun is unbelievably perfect for the e exact requirements of life. Were the earth any closer or further from the sun, the temperature on its surface would not allow life. Now, how do you explain that? It just is perfect. Now, that is design. Now, I can go on and on and on arguing that there is design in the universe. Uh, let, me, uh, let me pursue one more. That's only the beginning. The earth, I am told, turns over at more than 1,000 miles per hour. The moon, meanwhile, is circling the earth 365 miles per hour, uh, making one complete circle every 27 and one-third days. On top of that, the Earth, with the moon revolving around it, is revolving around the sun at the rate of 68,400 miles per hour. That's 19 miles per second. It makes one complete revolution every 24 hours and covers approximately 6 million miles a year. The sun is rotating, in the meantime, around another sun at the speed of 4,000 uh, 422,000 miles per day. The circumference of those circles is so great that it would take thousands of years to complete one cycle. Why doesn't something get off track and crash into something? Why don't we have this massive fender bender in the cosmos? Sir James Beans said, he's a great astrologer, uh, astronomer, thank you. After screaming, uh, scanning the heavens, said the universe seems to have been designed by a pure mathematician. Now, there is design in the universe. A, a real, let me put it real simply. If there were not design in the universe, we could not put a man on the moon. We can put a man on the moon because there's design and we can predict where the moon's going to be when he gets there. Got it? There's a third rational argument for the existence of God that's all balled down to cause, cause and effect, and it is this. The presence of people on this planet not only require a cause, but a personal cause. So that uh, it's one thing to create matter and put it in some kind of a design, but... Well, did you ever see an animal come out of a rock? No, no. Did you ever see a human come out of an animal? All right, that's the argument. That those are, cause, those are effects and there's got to be a cause. The cause has to be powerful, intelligent, right? And, I mean, if he created us, then he's intelligent. That's what Paul means in Romans 1.20. He says, power and Godhead. So, that's the argument for the existence of God. Now, let me just tell you that um, atheists might argue that nature produced the universe, including man. Couldn't the universe be its own cause? In the first place, the universe has never observed doing that. It has never made something out of nothing. Furthermore, something impersonal has never been observed producing something personal. Impersonal marble never carved a statue, must less create a human being. If the cause is not a person, it could not have produced a person. In other words, in the case of man, the cause was someone, not something. Uh, the universe is designed by somebody 
intelligent. Got it? All right. Did that bore you? Is that interesting? I've only given one reason so far, and that's a one evidence so far, and that's reason. Okay? There's two more. But I want to I want to say something more about this one. Here's the way I normally do this. I've done this so many times. I did it recently. I usually do it with college students. I take my watch off and I lay it on the table. And I say, tell me everything you know because that watch is there. And this is what they do. They, they never fails. They say, they give me the time. Good. They tell me that it's got a leather band on it. Eh, very good. They give me the color. In this case, there are no numbers on the face. They're little hash marks. Eh, that's good. And I keep saying, what else? What else? And they keep giving me observations. Let me tell you what I know because this watch is here. I know two things. Number one, I know that somewhere on this planet, there's a watchmaker. Make sense? I'm going to tell you a second thing I know. I know that because this watch is in my hand, there's a watchmaker who has more intelligence than I do because I can't make one of these things. Now, that is all I've said so far. This is the effect. The watchmaker is the cause. The universe is the effect. God is the cause. Design is the effect. God is the cause. People are the effect. God is the cause. Now, that just makes sense to me. I talked to a fellow recently who said he was an atheist. And uh, I said, how do you explain all of this? And he said, it's just chance. He said, it's like winning the lottery. It's just chance. Now, I had an answer, but... I was supposed to have another conversation with him and never materialized. I was going to save it for the next conversation. So I didn't give it to him. You know what the difference is? In the lottery, we got somebody running it. There's intelligence behind the lottery. Right? Right. Now, let me tell you. I know a fellow who wrote a book entitled, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. By the way, I highly recommend you read that book on this subject. Uh, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And furthermore, atheism is not logical. I'm arguing logic, reason, is evidence that there's a God. In the cosmological, teleological, and anthropological arguments for the existence of God. But an atheist is illogical. Atheism is illogical. Go take a course in logic. One of the laws of logic is you cannot prove a universal negative. It is illogical for me to stand up in here. There's such a thing as an eight-leaf clover. Why? Because I've never looked at all the clovers on the planet. There might be one. I can't say there isn't because I haven't examined them all, right? So it is illogical to say nowhere in the universe is there a God. Why? Because you haven't been all over the universe. You don't know that. Who was it, a Russian astronaut that went into the flew into the space and said he didn't see God anywhere. Some preacher said, well, if you'd have taken off that suit, you'd have seen him real quick. <laughs> How are we doing? Is there a God? If you say no, you know what God says about you? Can I give it to you real straight? You're stupid. <laughs> Psalm 14, look it up. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You know what the word fool means? Translated, stupid. Illogical. Now, if you said to me, I don't know, but I'm, there may or there may not be, that's called agnosticism, and that's, that's a legitimate position. But to say you're just an atheist is illogical. Violates one of the laws of logic. Not agnosticism. That's different. But if you're an agnostic, you say, I don't know, and hopefully you'd be looking for the truth, right? All right. 
That's the first reason I say there's a God. I have a second. The, se the second is revelation. The first evidence that there's a God is reason itself. Just think. The second is the Bible. Revelation. Now, I know people are going to say, uh, just because you claim something doesn't make it true. And uh, that's right, but just hear the claim first. There are two. First is the fulfillment of prophecy. Now, the Old Testament was written from 1500, that's a very rough number, uh, 1500 B.C. to 400 B.C. There's a gap of 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The New Testament was written from about 40, 45 A.D. to 95 A.D. So there's 400 years between the two. I'm going to tell you what the Old Testament said, the Hebrew Scriptures said about the coming of a Messiah 400 years before he came. And here it is. In 925 B.C., the Old Testament predicted the Messiah would be a descendant of David. That's in 2 Samuel 7, 12. In about 725 B.C., the Old Testament predicted that he would be born in Bethlehem. That's Micah 5, verses 2 to 5. Around 680 B.C., the Old Testament foresaw that he would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. About 530 B.C., the Old Testament foretold the time of his arrival. Whoa! Did you hear what I just said? The time of his arrival. Let me read you that passage. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks, and the streets shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. And after that sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. That's an astounding statement. Written 680 B.C. It says the Messiah's coming, and it gives it to us, and the figures are in weeks, but that word in that context means years, and it gives us the years, and they amount to 483. So what we have to do is take that passage and figure out, it says, Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So the question is, when was that command? Well, there are several possible answers. I spent a whole lot of time in the past trying to decide which one was right. And many scholars have concluded that the right one is a command that went out in 458 B.C. And I concluded they're right. If that's the case and you do the math, then that passage in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 and 26 is saying the Messiah is going to come around 26 B.C. And that is exactly when Jesus started his ministry. Then Daniel chapter 5 says he's going to be cut off, which is a term used in the Bible for dying but not for himself. That is unimaginable mm -hmm. that the Old Testament could predict the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. There is nothing else in history like that. Nothing else. Not in all of literature, not in all of philosophy, not in any religion. The only one that predicts that kind of thing is Christianity. So let me ask you, who's going to be the president of the United States in 2050? Now, wait a minute. Here's all you have to give me. You just have to tell me the city he's going to be born in. Just give me that. Mm -hmm. Okay, 2050. Can you do that? Would you even venture to try? All right. Hundreds of years before Jesus came, the Old Testament said he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Hundreds of years. And they give her all kinds of other things. I'm just picking two. It told what city was going to be born in. It said it was going to be the son of David. All right, tell me who's going to be president of the United States in 2050. 
And just give me the place where he's going to be born in his family name. That's all. Is he going to be Johnson, Smith, Brown, Jones? Just give me his family name and the city he's going to be born in. That's two. The Old Testament. I wrote a little booklet once entitled, Here are the 30 and there are more. Okay? So I say the Bible, Revelation, is a demonstration there's a God. Not, not, okay. Does that, make, does that make any sense? Absolutely. Do you buy that? Yes. You were convinced that before you already came. All right, let me give you a second one. The second thing from the scripture that has converted a lot of people is the fact that Jesus came back from the dead. The resurrection is part of that revelation. Now, I could preach all day on the resurrection. It comes down to three things. The tomb was empty. Number two, the grave clothes were undisturbed. That one's really fascinating. And number three, people saw him afterward. And they died rather than recant. Uh, the one about the grave clothes being undisturbed is one of the most fascinating. That is, when they did get into the tomb, the grave clothes, the body was wrapped in grave clothes. And the grave clothes were all still in place as if his body went through the grave clothes. So they were still in place. Incredible. Convince those who saw it. So, many people have examined the historical record of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and became Christians just based on that. Matter of fact, Sir Edward Clark said, quote, this is years ago, As a lawyer, I've made a profound, long study of the evidence for the events of the first Easter day. To me, the evidence is conclusive. And over and over again in the high court, I have secured the verdict on evidence not nearly as compelling. Inference follows upon evidence, and a truthful witness is always artless and disdains effort. The gospel evidence of the resurrection is of this class. And as a lawyer, I accept it unreservedly as the testimony of truthful men to the fact that they were able to sustain it. It's one lawyer. Many have come to a similar conclusion. So, the evidence for the existence of God is, first of all, reason. It just makes sense. It makes more sense than there is that this all just happened. Yeah, there was a big bang. Great. And where did the bang come from? Right? Where did all that stuff come from to produce a bang? And secondly, there is revelation. Now put these two things together. The creation tells us there's a creator who is what? Powerful and intelligent. So if there is a God that's not just a higher power, but a higher intelligence, has he communicated to us? Well, where do you find that communication? Go, uh, the, go, the discipline that studies that is called religion. You don't find that in math class. All right, go study the religions. Hinduism doesn't claim God revealed himself. It's reincarnation. Buddhism doesn't claim God has revealed himself. They're trying to eliminate suffering by following the eighth path of the middle way. Shintoism is ancestor worship. There are three. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They're the only three that claim God has revealed himself. The first person to say God revealed himself to me and write it down was Moses. Now, as a Christian, we accept everything that's in the Old Testament. So that leaves two, Christianity and Islam. Got it? So if you're looking for an intelligent, powerful God who's revealed himself, you're down to two choices, Christianity and Islam. It is either Jesus Christ or Mohammed. And how do you know which one is the truth? Well, what, let me give you some evidence for Jesus. His birth and a whole bunch of things about him were predicted hundreds of years before he came. Fulfill prophecy. And number two, he came back from the dead. I don't think it's even much of a debate. So, I said I had three reasons why there is evidence for the existence of God. Number one is reason. Number two is revelation. Number three is you. You? Yeah, Christians. 
people on this planet who claim they know God. Now, I know some people are going to say that's not much of an argument. Uh, But let me tell you what Jesus said. In John chapter 17, verse 2, he says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, he's speaking to the Father, and only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So, it's possible to know God according to the scripture. Millions of people, millions of people, say they have met God through Jesus Christ, and I'm one of them. You one of them? We're the evidence. I know, some people are going to say, well, that's not very conclusive. I grant that. I grant that. But let me put it like this. If that weren't true, everything else I've said wouldn't quite make sense, would it? It's not that this is the conclusive proof. It is the logical result of everything else I've said. If there is a God who is powerful and intelligent, who has revealed himself in the scripture, I would expect that we could know him through his son. So we are part of the evidence. It ought to be considered. It's what we would expect if everything else is true. Since the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, in every century, from every country, from every class and caste in society, Individuals have testified that they have met God through Jesus Christ. How does one explain that unless there is a God who's revealed himself through the scripture? I think about that. In every century, in every country, in every class, since the time he was born, people have stood up and said, this stuff is true, I trusted Jesus Christ, and this stuff works. Right? Can Hinduism say that? Can Buddhism say that? Can Shintoism say that? Can Judaism say that? Can Islam say that? You know, this gets pretty convincing after a while, doesn't it? I'm telling you, we got a case. And I think it's a very powerful case. Playwright William Alford is reported to have said, quote, People who tell me there is no God are like the sixth grade boy saying there's no such thing as passionate love. <laughs> Philip Hughes once wrote, He who experiences it cannot knock it, and he who knocks it has not experienced it, and should search his heart as to why. Have I convinced you? say, are you kidding me? I was convinced there was a God before I came. After all, this is church. (laughs) I know. I'm trying to give you ammunition to talk to people who don't. Mm -hmm. You got it? I've given you three reasons. Reason, uh, three evidences. Reason, revelation, and people who claim they've been regenerated through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, let me conclude by saying a couple of things. What's the alternative? There is no God. And there are people who are atheists. They honestly say that they don't believe there's a God. My question is, what evidence have you got? What evidence is there there is no God? What you have are questions, theories, and a huge amount of faith in your reason. That's what you got. But you don't have any evidence. And as I mentioned a moment ago, you violate one of the laws of logic. So it's much more reasonable to say that there is a God. Bertrand Russell, a very famous atheist, admitted that what I just said is true. I'm going to quote him. Quote, as a philosopher, if I were speaking to a purely philosophic audience, I would say... I ought to describe myself as an agnostic because I do not think that there is conclusive proof by which one can prove that there is not a God. End of quote. Thank you very much. On the other hand, 
as I have argued today, I think it is reasonable to say that there is a God. There is evidence. There is good evidence. There is logic. There is excellent logic. There is experience. It is believable experience. But with all of the evidence, there's one little element I've left out. And that is, you have to have faith. I think God designed it that way. Matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now there are people who are going to say, yeah, faith is just a leap in the dark. No, it's not. That's stupidity. Faith is believing facts. Let me repeat that. Faith is believing facts. So, God designed it so that you would have to believe him. Now, why did he do that? Well, if he gave you conclusive proof, irrefutable proof, scientific proof, I can pour these two things together, you wouldn't have any choice, right? And that's not what he wanted. He wanted to have a relationship with you that was willing and loving. So he said, I'll give you evidence, but I'm not, it's not conclusive. I'm going to leave a little room in here for faith. So you've got to trust me. Now let me tell you something. All relationships are based on faith. All relationships are based on faith. Friendship, family, business, all relationships. Would you do business with somebody you didn't trust? No. No. All relationships are based on faith. That you have evidence that says this is a trustworthy person and you're willing to do all kinds of things on that basis. Trust them with your money. Trust them with your secrets. Trust them with your marriage. Right? And the minute you quit trusting that person, the marriage, the relationship, including marriage, goes downhill. So God says, I want to have a relationship with you, but I'm not going to twist your arm. I'm not going to get you in a bear hug. I want you to willingly choose to have a relationship with me. And I made it possible. I'm sending my son down there to die for your sins and be raised from the dead. And all you have to do is trust him to get you to heaven. And you establish a relationship with me that's forever. Amen. Amen. So there's evidence. There's good evidence. And we shouldn't be embarrassed or fearful before somebody who says, I don't believe in Christianity. Well, maybe you got a problem. You think? Yeah. So maybe we ought to tell them, hey, there's some good evidence, and I've just given you a thimble full of it. If you really go get the book, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. It's got tons in there, and it's great read. Go get the book. And then you'll be really equipped. And tell them, and I met him. And they think, well, they'll think I'm a nut. Well, let them think you're a nut. At least give them the chance to know somebody on this planet believes there's a God and I know him. We'll get vindicated when we all stand before him. Because every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. That's in Philippians chapter 2. So trust him. Tell people he's out there and trust him to work in their life. Andrew Fuller, a preacher of a bygone day, was once riding his horse to church where he was to speak. The rivers were flooded because of a recent heavy rain. At one crossing, Fuller hesitated. A farmer nearby was watching and shouted, Go on, sir! It's safe! Fuller urged his horse into the water, but when it rose to the saddle, he stopped. Fuller nudged his uh, horse, who a few paces later 
found the water shallow. When he arrived at the church, Fuller used that experience as an illustration. He said, I couldn't see that there was solid ground under the water, but I trusted the farmer and discovered he was telling me the truth. The water was shallow, and I made it across. I say to you, the facts cry out. Go ahead and trust. Believe there's a God and trust his son, and you will find solid ground that you cannot see. Father.